So my talk is very much going to follow on the talk we heard this morning by Benjamin. <laughs> Uh, but mainly, I will start very much at the spot where Benjamin stopped at the end. So he was speaking just of the map from the elliptic GRT, Grotendieck Teichmutter Group, to the Grotendieck Teichmutter Group by degeneration, by letting tau tend to I infinity, and then the, that there's a section going the other way. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to pick on a couple of the ideas that he introduced in his talk. I'm going to, for, for reasons of simplicity, and clarity, I find it myself, I find it very helpful to stay only in the Lie algebra situation. So instead of the group GRT, I will go back to the golden dick murder Lie algebra that we saw in some past lectures. And the same, I will introduce the golden dick elliptic, GRTL, elliptic golden dick murder Lie algebra. And I will explain in Lie algebra terms, which I always I find simpler, maybe less geometric, but but much easier to, um, to, to, to see uh, explicitly, I will describe these maps and sections and what the Gotetic type or elliptic Lie algebra is like. And in the second part of the talk, I'll review the, the actual ex explicit construction of the elliptic associator of Benjamin, not in the way that he constructed it, but in a different way, but coming, that comes to the same thing. And in the last part of the talk, I will show how you exactly how this this elliptic associator arises from the Drinfeld associator and what elements of structure you have to add to the Drinfeld associator to get the elliptic associator and and mention some of the relations as, as, uh, satisfied by the elliptic associator and in particular the first natural question that I feel like asking because when you have the Drinfeld associator you have also, it satisfies double shuffle relations. So when you have the elliptic associator, you want elliptic double shuffle relations, and what are they? And I will show that you can drag the elliptic, the double shuffle relation satisfied by the Drinfeld associator through the construction of the elliptic associator and get a form of double shuffle relations for the elliptic associator. Only in the last part, it will be a bit less explicit because... Um, you cannot do it completely by staying in the world of power series. So in theory, you have to go to a, a mold theory, which I'm not going to do in the talk. So at some point there will be something to accept that something has a meaning, even though it isn't a power series. Okay, so that will be the end of my talk. So I'm going to start with just a very quick um, reminder about the, the usual. Uh, so the important thing to say is that it's in my approach, Everything elliptic is going to be related to the genus zero. So I'm always going to construct the elliptic things from the genus zero things and then with an extra ingredient, which is not the way Benjamin does it. Of course, his way is more geometric and it really starts directly from the elliptic situation. But what interests me is the connection between the two. And the reason this interests me is because it gives uh, ways of constructing both the Lie algebra and the associator that are that are very explicit. So I'm reminding quickly here just of the genus zero GRT, which is a basic um, ingredient of constructing the elliptic uh, Lie algebra. So again, I, I, okay, at each stage in this talk, I'm going to show how to construct something and maybe not the most natural elliptic construction, because I'll always be starting with genus zero in order to construct it. But I'll also um, explain the analogy, genus one, genus zero, in, in, a, in a reasonably geometric way. So first of all, we already saw this in the last talk. So I have to make a very important remark about these braid, genus one braidly algebras. Here is the, the remark that I think has... Uh, been quite mysterious to us. So in the profinite situation, when we wanted to move to higher genus, we took the mapping class groups, the fundamental groups of moduli spaces, genus zero, and in higher genus. And then we had a Gawa action on the genus zero ones and on the higher genus ones. And it turned out that the, the GT group that acted in genus zero, we couldn't get it to act on the higher genus ones until we added a further condition, meaning that our genus, our higher genus growth and decline group was a subgroup of the genus zero group. And what happens here is, is completely different. And the reason is this. The reason is, well, maybe there are many ways to explain the reason. So let me say a reason is because, well, the braid groups, you can take their associated Lie algebra as the pure braid groups. And we did that and we saw the braid Lie algebra. You cannot take the associated Lie algebra 
of the higher genus mapping class group, I mean, you can do it, you can take the, but it lose, you, you take the pro-unipotent completion and Leandro, you lose a lot of structure. So we cannot simply say, let's have a der of derivation algebra that acts on the Lie algebra associated to higher genus mapping class groups. So the best that has been done is what Benjamin chose to do uh, because of the situation is to restrict attention instead of the higher genus full mapping class group to take what we call the higher genus gray group. So it's inside the higher genus mapping class group. And it's given by, you have your, your genus uh, G surface with some marked points, and you have all the diffeomorphisms. That makes the mapping class group. And you have certain special diffeomorphisms in there, which are the ones obtained by moving the marked points around. And those, are uh, that's but they can move around the genus G surface. So that's the genus G braid group. It's a subgroup. It's certain special Brady, Brady uh, diffeomorphism of the genus G surface. And that one has a, a rich uh, Lie algebra, which doesn't lose any of the structure. And so we're now going to have, instead of acting on the mapping class group, we're going to have acting on the smaller thing, which is only the braid, uh, braid part of the mapping class group. And because of this, instead of getting smaller, the group actually gets bigger. So this is a way of explaining why the elliptic, the higher genus growth and dictatometer group in profinite is smaller than GT, and the higher genus growth and dictatometer group in pro-unipotent is bigger than GT, which is a very odd situation. But anyway, in this situation, we have no choice, at least no choice that we've discovered so far. Uh, we have to have the analog of the genus zero Bradley algebras be the higher genus Bradley algebras. And so that's what we're going to use here. So uh, Benjamin already showed you this presentation of the higher genus Bradley algebras. Okay, so in analogy with the simple uh, original construction of the Lie algebra GRT by Ihara acting on Bradley algebras, we have the same thing here. We're going to take derivations tangential derivations, not tangential derivations, just certain derivations of the Bradley algebras. But, but, and this is a very important point, the, we're going to take particular derivations and these derivations are going to come from genus zero in a particular way. So we're going to take psi that belongs to the genus zero GRT. And then, okay, so we have two, we have just like GRT acts on the four strand braid group, but it has to extend to the five strand braid group. Here, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to have it act on the two strand genus one braid group, but it has to extend to this three strand genus one braid group. So why two strands and three instead of one strand and two? It's because these braid groups are very already small. So the two strand braid group is free on two generators. The one strand braid group is free on one generator. So that doesn't give us anything interesting. So the proper analog of the four strand genus zero braid group is the two strand genus one braid group. And it is also free on two generators, but don't go thinking that this could be the same action on this group free on two generators as the GRT action, it's not. It's, it, the action is completely of a different nature. Okay, but the, so the elliptic algebra, it, it's made of triples like this. So psi is in GRT and it's gonna play a role down here. And these two elements, simply, when you send the two generators of this 3D algebra, you send them to these two elements. And the conditions on these triples for them to belong to GRTL are that when you extend to the three-strand genus one braid, the algebra, you have to map the generators this way. And this is, this is very much analogous to... It's not the same thing as saying these are tangential derivations. It's like the genus one analog of what we expect. And this choice that you don't have to add the extra factor here is just like up to an inner derivation, just like we had x maps to zero. So, so it's missing the, 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 the oh, it's, oh, right. This is plus minus. So each time when I write plus minus, I, I, mean, I mean either plus or minus. You can fill in plus, plus, plus everywhere or you can fill in minus, minus, minus everywhere. So this, this looks like one relation, but it's really two relations, okay? So yeah, this should be plus minus right there. Um, is that the only one that's missing? Okay. Um, okay, so this condition, of course, that this has to impose uh, be a derivation, but the braid Lee algebra has lots of relations. So this is imposed really strong relations and Benjamin wrote them out explicitly, which you have to be very courageous to do. So it's not really very beautiful and it's extremely hard to work with it. Like the whole idea of just calculating these alphas is this way is very difficult. 
in analogy with the fact that even calculating an element of GRT with a pentagon relation is difficult because you have to go to dimension two. Whereas if you pretend that they're equal to the double shuffle relations, which is just a conjecture, that's much easier to calculate. So what, what I always do when I want to calculate and study these is later I'll be introducing the elliptic double shuffle relations and I just always use those. Okay, um, so this is the actual definition. So I'm just going to show four little lemmas about this, which are, which are helpful to understand what it's like. Okay, so first of all, you don't need these three elements of the triple. To start with, alpha plus determines alpha minus. And this is just something very simple. It's always true. I, when, when you have a derivation that, thick, that set maps the, the bracket to zero, which is, which is done by, by every element of GRTL, then you only need to know its value at A, and that automatically determines the value of B if, if you exclude linear terms from your, uh, from your alpha. So I should say you can always take here to generate, you can always take um, psi of homogeneous degree n. And that will generate everything. Okay, so therefore alpha plus uh, always uniquely determines alpha minus. And this is even a, a formula that I worked out at some point to see what alpha minus is explicitly. So you have a nice formula to get that. So already in those triples, we don't need the notation alpha minus. Okay, curiosity about this. These are very important. So you, you just wonder, like, what are the elements where psi is equal to zero? And this is a these are very important elements. They play a big role. In fact, they, they play even a much bigger role than what I'm going to say, because in some sense, I might say these, these elements determine everything. But I won't go into that. I want to say that there are many of them. They're important. And the, the only way I have to prove that they exist is to give examples. So these are very important um, derivations that appear frequently in the theory. And you can work out quite easily that they just give examples of these. And there's... These are the derivations which I did by delta in the last... Uh, oh, right, right. Uh, Benjamin calls these delta. Delta, they're the same ones. Okay. And yeah, so the full set of elements like these, he calls it RL. And it's, did we just conjecture that these epsilons generate all of RL? And this is not a known conjecture, but I wish it was because it would be very useful. Um, and I, there are many indications that this should be the case, but for, so far we don't have a proof. So lemma three, not only does alpha plus determine alpha minus uniquely, but it also uh, determines psi uniquely. So in the end, all we need is just one power series alpha plus, which is the value of the derivation. You see GRTL as a, as a derivation in the algebra. It's the value of the derivation on A. Uh, let me remind that I, I oh, okay, let me, let me say this is probably pretty important. This notation X plus, X1 plus and X1 minus, very often I just call them A and B. So this is, and this is Benjamin's notation. I always call the elliptic freely algebra at Li AB. So always just thinking A is X1 plus and B is X1 minus. So wherever you see AB, it's, it's T12 with X1 plus and X1 minus. Okay, so this is a very cute little, oops, I forgot some backslashes there. This is a very cute little proof given by Nils Matis. Um, I found it again, the one in Zurich. Uh, or I asked him and he found it again. So it's a little trick. If you have these relations here, if all the alphas are zero, then you just have to have this equals zero for both plus and minus, but it's enough to say just for plus. So if this is zero, so what he says is, if you take just this object in here and you, you, you kill the first strand, you pull out the first strand, this goes to zero because uh, this goes to zero, T12 goes to zero. And so and this whole thing is in the kernel. And there, but, but also the whole term is in the kernel. And the key, point that, the key point that he makes is that the kernel is a freely algebra. So because this is in the kernel and the whole thing is in the kernel, that means that you've got x1 plus times uh, bracket something in the kernel is zero and in a freely algebra. That's got to mean that the thing you're bracketing by is already zero. So you get that this thing here is already zero, not just in the kernel, but actually equal to zero. And then you use the exact same argument, but now you pull out the third strand. So this thing goes to zero. So the whole thing is equal to zero, but both parts of it are in the kernel of P3, and it's a bracket of something in a freely algebra, so this has to be zero as well. So that's how he proves it. It's a cute little trick, which I, took me again 15 minutes to work out again last night, because every time I see it, I think, oh, how does this work? How does this work? Okay, so here's a lemma, which isn't a lemma. It's actually a really important theorem. Uh, a major, um, major important property and way of constructing 
the 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 um, elliptic GRT algebra. So you have a, a map from GRTL. Okay, I wrote psi. I shouldn't have written psi. I should have written GRT, which is just you have the triples psi alpha plus alpha minus, and you just erase alpha plus alpha minus, and you just keep psi, and that gives you a map. Uh, down to GRT, whose kernel is exactly the RL that we saw before. And you want to know if it's surjective. And the answer to the question of whether it's surjective comes here with the fact that you also have a section map of that kernel. But the section map is very important. It's remarkable. And it's got lots of special properties that I have no time to go into. I'm just going to tell you what it is in, in a way which will probably make Benjamin unhappy. <laughs> okay. So... The only technical little element of this description is here. This is very, very interesting. You have the typical Bernoulli series, very familiar. Um, you have your, like these, gen these generators. You take these three elements, their sum is equal to zero. And you have a map. So this is, think of this as being the genus the, the Lie braid algebra on four strands, the G to zero first Lie algebra. And this is T12, the two strand genus one Lie algebra. So you have here a map. Now, why do you have here a map? The, if you were going to say this topologically, you take a P1 minus three points and you take two of your points or holes and you join them. And you do this, you make a genus one uh, surface with one mark point. And that immediately gives you a map of the pi one of the P1 minus three points towards the pi one of the, of the one puncture torus. Now, when you take that map and you move to the pro-unipotent completions of these, um, of these topological fundamental groups, the map kind of changes in particular. Well, it, 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 it changes. It becomes this map, in fact. This Lie algebra map is the Lie algebra version of the pro-unipotent map, which is just the map that I just said, rendered pro-unipotent. And here's what it is. You just an X to T12 and Y to T01 of the series that I showed you before. So T12 is nothing but the bracket AB. T01 is really a Bernoulli series. Okay, so you've got the subalgebra T sitting inside Lee of AB. And it's the, the, it's the echo of genus zero sitting inside there. Now you take something in, okay, I should have called this Psi in GRT. Okay, F in GRT. And here you have the Ahara derivation that we saw in past lectures. And you just move it over to T, just the same way. Instead of X goes to zero, T12 goes to zero. Instead of Y goes to Y bracket F of XY, you just, you just shift it over. Now, this derivation, it has a unique extension to a derivation alpha of all of the A. And alpha plus is the image of A of this extended derivation. So the real meaning of the section is just, you go from genus zero to genus one by extending from the sub thing to the whole thing. So, and this here, you get your alpha plus and your alpha minus back. And you do this, the proof of this lemma is really very direct because you can actually work it out uh, uh, weight by weight, just weight by weight, one weight at a time, working out the value of T01. And you solve for it at every stage and you simply construct your alpha plus from from side. Oh, let me say one last thing that the bracket of these is the Ihara bracket that we saw earlier. But the bracket of these derivations is, well, the bracket of the Fs is not, is not the usual bracket on, on Lee XY. It comes from the bracket of the derivations. And here's the same. The bracket of these it's just the bracket of derivations, and that's the Lie algebra uh, bracket on, on these elements, just the bracket of derivations also. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk's finished. It's really the Lie algebra version, but it, you do all the same exact thing in pro-unipotent groups, and you get exactly what Benjamin was talking about at the very end of his lecture, in the overtime. So now I'm just, I'm changing subjects. I'm going to talk about the elliptic associator, which of course he also talked about, and I'm going to talk about it again. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to show you how you can construct it. I'm actually going to do this in two different ways. So the first way comes straight out of Benjamin's paper, but Benjamin would consider this as a property of the, of the elliptic associator rather than a construction, but I like to use it as a construction. Because, and this is very important because GRTL, we saw that it splits into two parts. It splits into the image of GRT by the section and the RL. In fact, it's a, it's a semi-direct product of those two pieces. It just is completely made up of those two pieces. And you can say the same of the elliptic associator. It breaks really into two pieces. 
a genus zero piece and a genus and, and an RL piece, basically. So, okay, the first ingredient is this. This automorphism, G tau. This is an automorphism of, okay, I shouldn't have written this because it's not true. It should be QAB tensor, the coefficients of this. So, so there, it should be tensor functions on the upper half plane. Because the co coefficients of G tau are certainly not rational. They are functions of tau. Every, uh, yeah, well, you can see it here, basically, okay? So here, what I should have had is coefficients in O of H. Okay, so you can get lots of G tau's this way. You take all the solutions. You want to pick one good solution. Benjamin normalizes one solution by uh, just specifying asymptotic behavior. So now you have this very important uh, element G tau, which is an automorphism of power series in A and B. And it's related closely to our friends, the epsilons, which were dealt with in the previous talk. In fact, you can, you can expand it out as a as a series in the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra of these derivations. And so here's what happens that's important. You have coefficients here, which are GKs. The, and GK for a K like this, it's a, the iterated integral of the Eisenstein series. Oh, these are all functions of tau. I didn't write tau, but these are all functions of tau. And your end result, this is a function of tau, tau on the upper half plane. Okay, but when I say the coefficients of G tau, I don't mean these, because these monomials here are not linearly independent. So what you want to do is you want to choose a basis of the space of these monomials. You want to write G tau in that basis and take the coefficients. So there will be linear combinations of these. So by no means are the coefficients of G tau all of these. It's a certain very particular subspace. In fact, that subspace is isomorphic to the dual of the universal enveloping algebra of the, the derivation algebra on the epsilons. The G T tau is, reflects exactly the structure of the algebra of derivations generated by the epsilons. It contains exactly the same amount of information. What? Yeah, this is in our paper with Matis. Yeah. Okay, so now I'll define the elliptic associator. So it's this pair of two power series, both with coefficients being functions of tau, power series in A and B, and, okay, you want to, you want to consider in, okay, here I wrote the right ring, but inside here you want to consider the group-like elements. So power series starting with one that are group-like, that's a group. And you can consider this as an automorphism of that group. So the tricky cute thing that Benjamin does is instead of considering the Lie algebra to be, so Lie AB, we're always talking here about the completed Lie algebra. It's always a power series, not, not polynomials. So, in the, so this T01 we saw was an, an element of the completed Li AB. And instead of considering A and B as generators, you consider T01 and B as generators. So which you could do just as well, so then you can get A back from those. Okay, so, so then you consider the group of group like people here. I would have said, you know, take E to the A and E to the B as generators, but instead he takes E to the T01 and E to the B as generators. Okay, and it, it's an automorphism of that group. And it's just like we saw before, everything in GRTL fixes, um, well, everything in GRTL is least, so it sends bracket AB to zero. So the automorphism fixes bracket AB, so it fixes E to the bracket AB. And as we saw before, then if you know the, one, the action on the first generator, you can reconstruct the action on the second generator. So we often just say A tau is the elliptic associator. Just like we had, you only needed alpha plus in the, in the Lie version. And so here's the formula. You first define a certain A, which is just given by this explicit formula. And so you can see that its um, coefficients are just multiple zeta values, the usual ones. And you can prove that the coefficients of the series, like phi kz, generate all multiple zeta values. And then you take g tau of that, and this is your a tau. Okay, so now we have the definition, we have the isomorphism. But why do we call it an associator? Well, it's an associator. To call something an associator, uh, well, we have the Drinfeld associator. We want to have an analogous properties, and that's what we have. We have many analogous properties. I mean, these are many reasons for which this is the elliptic associator. So, first of all, it arises the same way from the case, the usual differential equation, and the the one that was described in the previous talk. Also, you get it as, in fact, literally as, in, as iterated integrals of the differential form. 
And you get this one as iterated integrals of the corresponding differential form. Uh, we didn't talk much about this at all, and so I'm not going to get into it, but Drinfeld associated yields isomorphisms basically from groups to their graded versions. The graded version is the exp of the Lie algebra, and the group itself, it's given by this, this, the same relations as in the topological fundamental group. And you have an isomorphism from this group to that group is given by the Drinfeld associator, or by any associator, in fact. And the same is true in genus one here. Here you just have a group which looks like the pi one of uh, the one's punctured torus generated by, by these three letters. And here you have the graded version. And the, uh, the elliptic associator or any, any elliptic associator in GRTL gives you an isomorphism from here to here. Okay. Um, you, well, this is something that I already said earlier in the talk, but basically, Automorphisms of the four strand break group that expand to the five. And in elliptic case, we have automorphisms of the twice of the two strand genus one break group extended to three strands. So that's similar too. Um, basically, okay, so in many ways, this is this is the correct associator analog of the of the genus zero associator. Okay, this is a short one, just a one slide part. Um, you really want to know what elliptic multi-zeta values are. So just like you have the Drinfeld associator and multi-zeta values are their coefficients, here, the ring of elliptic, of elliptic multi-zeta values is going to be generated by the coefficients of a tau and b tau, which is pretty much the same thing as just the coefficients of a tau. B tau is almost superfluous. There's a very small, uh, there's a couple of details here to, to make life simpler, which is that I work mod zeta of two, and I add this function. Uh, those are little technical details, but if, if you do that, then you can actually prove that because a tau is g tau of a, you, the elliptic multi-zeta values, the coefficients of a tau are, are all uh, algebraic expressions in the coefficients of g tau and the coefficients of a. And all you do is you prove that it actually contains all of them. It contains everything. So it contains all the coefficients of g tau and all the coefficients of a. And it certainly doesn't contain anything more because it's g tau of a. So it, that is what it is. It's the ring of coefficients of g tau tends to the ring of coefficients of a. And you, with a little, oops, sorry, with a little work, you prove the ring of coefficients of a really is all multi-zeta values. It looks like phi kz, but it was phi kz conjugate something. So there's just something to check. But it, you get all the multi-zeta values. And what about the, the coefficients of g tau? They give you this algebra u, which, as I said before, u is the dual of the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra of the, of the epsilon 2k. So that tells you exactly its, its structure and, and, and what it looks like. OK, so we actually know what the ring of elliptic multi values look like, and it, it it, 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 could, it falls into these two pieces of which one is genus zero and the other is made of the epsilons, which is exactly the same thing for it. As a matter of fact, I kind of wonder whether this doesn't prove that RL is generated by the epsilons. I think. It was just occurring me to me this morning, but to, okay, to be talked about. Okay, now in order to, I'm going to give a second construction of the elliptic associator. Oh, wow, I'm going really fast. This is good. In order to give a second construction of the elliptic associator, I'm going to work mod zeta of two. I, I haven't done this when you don't work mod zeta of two, but given all Francis Brown's work, I believe this construction can be completely generalized to the to the um, to not working mod zeta of two. But I like this; it's simple. Also, I use some elements of mold theory, which I don't mention here, but they do require zeta of two equals zero. Okay, so from now on, I'm just going to work mod zeta of two. So this, with a bar on it, it's just the same Drinfeld associator, but with a coefficients mod zeta of two. It's still very rich, like it has all the other zetas in it. Okay, so we had this, and we have this. Notice that this is not, well, here I had e to the two pi i t zero one before, so I've had to take away two, two pi i, otherwise everything would be zero. Okay, so I define this. This is the mod two, Drinfeld, uh, the mod two elliptic associator. And I, what I want to do is, I want to, I want to use the section from GRT to GRTL. The Drinfeld associators in GRT tensor multi-zetas. And what happens when I take the section of that? Then I'm going to get something that is looking like the, like the associator, 
but not quite. It was as close to the associator that actually determines the associator. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm simply going to take the Drinfeld associator, in, consider it in GRT, and take the section that we saw earlier. So I'm going to consider it in there. This is now the Lee version of the Drinfeld associator, okay? Uh, you have this. GRT is a Lee algebra. It has... Uh, it has universal enveloping algebra. The universal enveloping algebra has a Poincaré, Birkovit multiplication. And when you when I write this, what I mean is you just take this with a with a multiplication that naturally occurs in the universal enveloping algebra of GRT. Okay, so this is just the Lie version of the Drinfeld associator. Um, I think it's nice to work with everything in the Lie algebra. We have the Yahara derivation. We transport it over. What am I doing? I'm just taking the section of the uh, of this Liedrenfeld associator. We do. We use the proposition to show that it has a unique extension to a derivation of the whole thing. And now you take that derivation. You take x of that derivation to get an automorphism. So it gives an automorphism of this. And let e be the value on a of the derivation, and big E be the the value on e to the a of the automorphism. So these are the same thing, but just Lie like and group like of the same thing. Notice you have a double exponential here. You have an exponential of the derivation to make the automorphism and an exponential of a to make e of a. Okay, but I call this the, the Lie like version and this the group like version, but one, this is not actually x plus that. It's like double, double x plus that. Okay, so what have we got when we take the, the big one? You have an automorphism of this. It maps e to the a to this big e. It fixes that. So it's completely determined as an automorphism. And when you apply this automorphism to e to your 0, 1, you get this, which is just a. So if you now apply your, your automorphism to g tau, you apply g tau, you basically get what happens is you get this. You get e of a goes to the element we just constructed. The, the extension to, to genus one of the Drinfeld associator. And these guys give you Benjamin's elliptic associator. So what's really happening here is that this element here determines everything. They're all, they should be considered like a triple. Like you don't need three generators of this ring. You don't need A, T0, 1, and B, but you can take them. They, they go together nicely like a triple of generators. It's like when we say X, Y, Z with X, Y, Z equals one. And all three of them have important values and they just belong together. Like, like the, in my head, the elliptic associator is really this triple. Okay. But you don't actually need A of tau and B of tau because E of tau determines everything because when you have the value on A and you fix the bracket AB, then the others are completely determined by it. Okay. So in some ways, it's nice to work with this because you, you can write it explicitly as integrated integrals and all of that, which I did before, which I don't know how to do with E of tau. But in other ways, it's better to work with this one. For instance, if, because it comes directly from the Drinfeld associator. It's just the section of the Drinfeld associator and then with G tau applied to it. And because the Drinfeld associator satisfies all these properties that we know, they're very easy to translate over to E of tau. And once you translate them over to E of tau, you can then force a translation over to A of tau, but it's all much uglier. So I'm going to just stick with E of tau to finish up. It's, so it's, you just get it by that automorphism, which is, which is the section of GRT to GRTL, and then applying the G of tau. This I call it the elliptic generating series. Its coefficients unsurprisingly generate the same ring. I should have put a bar here because it's just made of the phi KZ, which has the multi zetas, and then applying G of tau. So it's not surprising that you just get the same ring. So I'm going to finish with this. Um, phi KZ satisfies double shuffle relations that we saw. What happens to those double shuffle relations when we, um, when we go to this? But I'm going to do it just in the Lie algebra case. So this is an automorphism. We saw that the, it was X of the derivation that came from, from GRT, extending GRT to GRTL. This is an automorphism. The composition is an automorphism. So when I take the log of it, I again have a derivation. So this is going to be my key derivation. So this here is what I call the Lie elliptic generating series. Um, all this passage between group like and Lie like, group like and Lie like is very um, non-significant. It's just convenient. 
I find that you can write the double shuffle relations more simply in the least situation you write you can calculate the series better in the least situation so i like to work in the least situation I've, things tend to simplify a little bit but you go back and forth uh between them easily with no loss of information okay so at the end of my talk which is going to be very soon is cheating because i cannot properly express the, the elliptic double shuffle relations in terms of power series the reason is I will show you the reason. The reason is this. There's a certain operation that you can have, which I shouldn't have called D because D already meant something else earlier. So I'm very sorry that I called it D. I should have picked a different letter, but okay, forget everything before. D is now something new. D is this operator. It just takes a polynomial F of XY and it changes Y to XY and, and brackets with X. Okay. Well, I would like to invert D. I need to invert D. The trouble is, I can't invert D on a polynomial in general. I can only invert D if the polynomial already looked like this. So in order to invert D, I need to go into a world that will allow me to have some kind of denominators. And this world has been completely created by the mold theory of Jean Eckhart, which nobody has introduced here, although it plays a role and people are, are studying it a lot in this domain. But we haven't talked about it this week. So I'm certainly not going to introduce it now. But it moves two non-commutative variables into an infinite number of commutative variables. And so instead of power series in x, y, you have power series in like u1, u2, u3, up to infinity. But nothing prevents you from taking rational functions in the uis as well. And you are allowed to have denominators. And this operator becomes invertible in that world. So all the power series live happily in that world, but you widen it up and you get more things with denominators. So if you just accept that this is something that is legitimate and exists in, in, an, in an increased world, which cannot be expressed in the non-commutative variables, cannot be expressed in the power series, if you, if you just admit that, then we, can, we will discover that this, the, this, the D minus one of our elliptic generating series is simply going to satisfy double shuffle the same double shuffle as the double shuffle of phi kz. No, that's not true. I take it back. Not the same double shuffle as, as phi kz. Phi kz satisfies a double shuffle where the first one is this for the delta, but the second one is not this. We saw this second delta star. The delta star was not the usual... Um, co-product that just acts on every generator by thing tensor one plus one tensor thing. It was a different co-product, which acted on y k's by the sum of y j plus y l with j plus l. It was, k. It was a different co-product. And phi k z satisfied these two equations. Okay, I made a little mistake here. The interesting thing satisfied by d minus one of e tau is that actually you don't have to take the star here you can take just the correction here and the normal co-product. So this is called the linearized version. It's, a, it's the version of the double shuffle relations, which is not the one satisfied by phi kz or by the elements of the double shuffle Lie algebra, but by its associated gradient. So if you take the double shuffle Lie algebra, it has a depth filtration. You can have the associated gradient for the depth filtration and the the double shuffle relations and the associated grader are much simpler. They're bigraded. They don't have uh, solutions where you have to add together many different depths to get a solution. They're, they're just like taking the, the complicated stuff of relation on the lowest depth part of the element. So you have two shuffle relations, in fact, in the associated graded, And those are the relations that are satisfied here. If you just allow yourself, if you accept that this has a meaning in the world with denominators, you simply have that it satisfies two relations, which are not the relations of double shuffle, but the relations of linearized or graded double shuffle. And that's the elliptic double shuffle. The general, um, the general definition of elliptic double shuffle relations are take your element, it satisfies elliptic double shuffle relations, if and only if the D minus one of that element satisfies the linearized double shuffle relations of genus zero. So the section from GRT to GRTL is, is like an untangling. It, 
if you think about it, it's interesting. Is it acts on GRT? GRT is inside double shuffle. The GRT elements all satisfy the usual complicated double shuffle. When you take the section, it's just an isomorphism. It's just another representation of GRT, but it's bigraded. Bi it lands in a bigraded world. In fact, I will tell you uh, a little conjecture. I'm about to finish. This is my last slide. Yeah, I'm done. So I'll just make one last remark. Oh, it was very good. I'm going to make one last remark. So it's my little conjecture. I have a little conjecture. My little conjecture says, take the section from GRT to GRTL. The theorem of Benjamin says that the GRTL is then the image of the section, semi-direct RL, those elements RL. But what I say is, we always, when we have a filtered, when we have a filtration on the space, we always take the associated graded. This is a very normal thing to do. But there's another associated graded we could take, which is instead of, being a quotient like bigger is we take our elements, which are the sum of pieces of many depths, and we cut them into depth pieces, and we add all the pieces to our space. So we make our space bigraded by making it bigger. We just take all the, all the pieces that we have only added together, and we just add them separately to the space, and then this is GRTL. That if you just take the image of GRT, and you cut every element of the image into its depth, thick depth pieces, and add them all to the space, that that is what actually you're getting when you're getting the elliptic um, golden dictator. So computation has borne this out so far. In fact, we have many, many conjectures of different kinds relating those other pieces to the epsilons, and all the conjectures fit together very nicely to make a good picture. None of them are proofed yet. And they go in a circle. Each one implies the others, and it goes round and round. So all of these things are unproven yet. But it's a kind of... Uh, a different explanation of the relation between the image of GRT and GRTL and the whole space. Is that actually a, GRT determines the whole space. There, I'm done. Two our speakers, and do you have uh, any questions or uh, comment? So here, this elliptic double shuffle, so... Uh, the the, the second equation is not written right. I should have written linearized double shuffle. So you, you have a gamma factor. Huh? Gamma, gamma function. So, usually, multiple zeta value, you have a gamma function to go to from pi to pi, pi star. Yeah? You have a. Yeah, well, actually, in the, in the Lie algebra situation, you don't need this, Maybe. right? That's multiplicative. Uh -huh. In the Lie algebra situation, you don't need because it's, you just have one correction term. So, this is a bigraded situation. So, Lie algebra situation, we have correction term, but you are now working by graded setting, so that's why no D uh, gamma factor. Rationness, you are, DM allows a fraction. You're, you're right, you're right. There's yeah. a correction term, and the correction term is contained here. It's in this star. This is a oh. correction term. Oh. But oh. it's just the thing plus one term. You don't have to multiply by the gamma function okay. because it's linearized. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, the correction term is the same. It's the same correction wow. term that you already know. Thank you. So can you repeat um, what you said about uh, adding uh, graded pieces to GRT? So is it that you take the depth filtration for uh, GRT and take the associated graded for the depth filtration? Is it what you mean? So if you take an element of GRT that's, say, a fixed weight N, okay. it has many depths. Yeah. Depth is the number of Ys in the monomials. Yeah. Okay, now you take your section, you apply it to that element. Mm -hmm. And there you see that it, it's got an interesting shape, the result. It has an interesting shape. It's, you have many weights and many depths. It's an infinite series, but every weight corresponds to exactly one depth. Mm -hmm. And you just take each of those weight depth pieces, each of them separately, and mm -hmm. add them to your space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in this way, uh, well, the, the conjecture says that all of them except in weight 2n plus 1, all of them are... Oh, let me just take the case of a depth 1 element of GRT. Then mm -hmm. 2n plus 1 is the key weight. Below that and above that, everything is supposed to be in RL. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a theorem, actually. We believe that RL is just made of the epsilons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you add them, you're just adding on... If, so if you add all those pieces, you're just adding on RL. So if you don't worry about the epsilons, is this actually... This is actually a true fact, that if you cut off the pieces, you get GRTL. If you want them to be the epsilons, then you're still in the world of conjectures. <laughs>
Okay, we have to discuss it, but okay, thank you.